Hi everyone, uh, thank you very much for joining us live and for watching the films. I have the three filmmakers ready for the Q&A and uh, first I would like them to introduce themselves so you know uh, who they are and what films they, uh, they've directed. There you are, you're on camera now. Okay. <laughs> so starting so with well, Lorena if you want. Uh, okay, so my name is Lorena. I'm a documentary researcher, filmmaker, and teacher, and my film is Pilas. Great. And Tal? I'm Tal Amiran. Uh, I made the short uh, doc Daffametti, and I'm based in London, in East London. Great. And Katia? Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Katia. I'm a journalist and a documentary filmmaker, and I'm based in Geneva, and my film that you just seen it was a uh, green hand cricket. Great. Um, my first question for all of you, a uh, general question is, uh, how did you gain um, access to the subjects in your documentaries and how was the research process behind it? Starting with Lorena again, if you want. Um, um, so I started the process quite a long time ago, in 2014. I was given a scholarship by Ivermedia to do a course in creative documentary in Cali, Colombia. And because it was my first time going to Colombia, I was going to spend three months. Um, I thought that I really want to try to make a film. Um, so I started doing research from the UK. Um, and through a friend, Sandra Higgins, I met um, Lady Yomara Rodriguez, who is the um, president of the foundation that has um, um, that created or set up the music school where the film was um, shot. Um, so I was in touch with her and um, she explained to me what the idea behind the music school was and it felt really close to my heart. So um, uh, they invited me to spend a couple of weeks there and during those weeks I was able to meet the girls who were part of this music school and to establish some sort of a relationship. I filmed quite a lot but when I came back I realised that they didn't have that much material to really, um, you know, create a story and and make a documentary. Um, so I went back in 2016 and then back again in 2018. So yeah, it's been a long process, but very. Um, uh, it has been quite a learning journey for me. So very and uh, Tal. So in terms of access to the film, my film is about uh, undocumented Senegalese migrants in Paris who make, uh, try to make a living supporting themselves and their families back in Senegal selling souvenirs of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, access, so, um, so access, you know, to begin with wasn't, wasn't easy. So it started off by me approaching uh, the vendors, starting a conversations. Many of them don't speak English and I don't speak French. So the spoken languages in Senegal are Wolof and, and French. Uh, I was able to communicate with sellers who were speaking English. Um, and gradually I built trust. I had, so the main way of getting access was through a Senegalese, French Senegalese uh, uh, friend based in Paris who was helping mm -hmm. me, um, you know, in terms of somebody who speaks the language, it, it validated me in the eyes of many of the vendors. You know, this, this kind of guy from London just showing up, asking them questions. Many of them were understandably suspe suspicious. So having, um, you know, my interpreters with me, both, so I worked with two, uh, were just amazing because they spoke the language, they, you know, they validated me, I understood a lot, not just language, but culture, uh, through them. So when we did the interviews, so that was like a huge way of, of getting the access was uh, through them. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, Katia? Uh, yes, yeah, so I started following the abortion debate uh, as a news journalist. So um, as you know, uh, the abortion was uh, legalized in Ireland first uh, in uh, uh, May. So when it came to Argentina, I was so certain it's going to happen for Argentina because at the time I was covering uh, South America and I have witnessed such a strong women movements, like so well organized, showing up for every protest and demonstration. And I felt like it just can't go wrong. And then uh, I, myself, uh, I was mistaken as uh, many. So 
it sort of started with me trying to figure out what happened, what, what went wrong. And uh, um, I was talking to uh, people from uh, Argentina, I was talking to activists, and then I just started documenting this conversation, just trying to figure out. And this is how it started. And the, the way I got access to my character was literally word of mouth. So I would talk to one person and this person was like, look, you, you have to talk to these people as well. So it was um, never ending conversations that I had with the women really? that you were um, so into. And I guess this uh, question is more interesting for filmmakers, but um, how many uh, members of the crew did you have whilst you were filming and what did you shoot on? Like what camera, what equipment did you use? Starting with uh, Lorena, if you want again. Um, so um, so I filmed, I had a 5D Mark II at that time, and I also used a Canon C100 and different sound things, um, Zoom recorder, a boom microphone, I had wireless um, um, radio mics as well. So kind of a, a bit precarious, uh, precarious, so not like fully professional equipment. Um, and in terms of um, team, it was pretty much myself during the shooting. I had help to film the concert uh, from a camera operator in, in, in Colombia. And then um, I had a lot of help um, in post-production. So um, the editing was done with Lina Gomez, who is a fantastic Colombian editor. And the sound was done with a friend of mine, Laura Romero. And I did the gala in London with Lydia Raviso. And then um, I, I worked pretty much in collaboration with the um, people who were at the music school. So they helped as well with bits and bobs, but they, they weren't professional filmmakers. So it has been kind of quite um, handcrafted in some ways. Very, not that much professional, but I think the result is, okay. is, is good. It's yeah. really good. Uh, and what about you, Tal? What do you use to? So I shoot, I, I'm a very sort of one-man band, so I shoot, I edit, uh, and I do everything, well, not everything, but, um, so I shoot, I shot on a A7 III, mirrorless camera, and I think in my films, because of the subject matter, it's really important that I have a very small footprint. I'm not going to shoot uh, with a huge camera. Mm -mm. I want to be, you know, as concealed as possible, not drawing too attention to myself as well, especially shooting in public spaces like, uh, Chocodira around the Eiffel Tower and when there's some security it's really important for me to keep a low profile so f for the B-roll um, as well as shooting in uh, one of the migrants accommodation so I'm only shoot always shooting uh, with that small camera uh, same with, uh, with the lavalier microphone interviews always done uh, somewhere very close to to where they work it was the, the same with, with my previous short Sun Men these guys you know you can't just ask them, okay, let's go to the studio, let's come to, to my, my Airbnb flat. You want to be close to where they are when they're co comfortable. Uh, and then I work closely uh, with my sound designer, uh, Rick Blading, who's been my sound designer on, on all my shorts so far, and he's incredible. And, and the composer was Monofi, who's a Taiwanese uh, composer, and she now lives in, uh, she's based in Tokyo, and she's incredible. So I do the editing. So I edit and I shoot, yeah. Shout out to, to all of those people you've collaborated with. And what about you, Katia? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah I very much share um, sort of the same uh, way of uh, filmmaking and style. So it, uh, I shot a film on the GH5 Panasonic, which uh, happens to be my first filmmaking camera. I just got it like a few months before shooting it. And you know, I, I'm a trained journalist by education so I used to have cameramen with me at all times so this documentary was my first attempt to uh, shoot and edit everything independently because I learned shooting and video editing later in my career and um, it was the uh, sound gear was uh, raw and uh, uh, I used uh, um, a zoom recorder as well and um, it was all sort of filmed in a run and gun fashion because it was me spending seven to ten days in Argentina running around the city and then at some point I decided to visit the prison uh, with all the gear that I could take to, to get there by, by foot so it was like very important that equipment was light, portable and uh, 
and do the work mm -hmm. as possible. Right. And uh, I wonder if, uh, what was the idea behind making the films and did it change throughout the process whilst you were editing or whilst you were shooting? Starting with Lorena again. Um, so I didn't have a very clear idea at the beginning um, and I, it, it took me a, a lot of time to figure out which kind of film I wanted to make because um, since I was invited by the institution um, but I didn't want to make a film about the institution. I wanted to make a film based on, you know, the girls who, who were part of the music school. It took me a while to um, see how I could do that. Um, um, and the idea was kind of give visibility to these amazing girls who are playing instruments and they are very good at, uh, at it. But at the same time, they live in very complicated circumstances. And, you know, like the, uh, most of them come from families, single parent families. And um, the mothers are in a situation of, um, you know, like they, they work in the informal economy. They don't have access to a lot of resources. Um, so, yeah, it changed quite a lot throughout the process. And um, also because I was very interested in involving them as much as possible in the process. So we were um, doing what Agnès Varda called cine culture. Right? We, we film, write, film, write, and everything changes at every stage. So yeah, it was a very kind of interesting process right. throughout. Um, and what about you, Tal, uh, sorry? So for me, it's always the process of discovery. So I never do like, a, I, I do research, but the ideas always come, I'm quite visual. So my ideas, to, the ideas to my films come often by chance. So I happened to be in Paris uh, with my previous film at the festival uh, shown in Paris. I happened to go to the Eiffel Tower with, and then a few days later, my, my wife and kids joined me and we went to Trucadero and then I just witnessed this amazing uh, phenomenon of like hundreds of, of guys selling identical souvenirs. Uh, and there was something quite, uh, quite weird about it as well, because I've noticed every half an hour or so, police officers will just emerge out of nowhere, will just chase them, and they will just grab the souvenirs, just run for their lives. It was like a cat and mouse, m mouse kind of chase. And tourists will be filming it on their phones and laughing. It was a bit of a, like a theatre show. And then also, you know, that sort of um, uh, contrast between what they were selling, which is the symbol of France, the Eiffel Tower, yet I realized that they all un must be undocumented. They must be selling these souvenirs illegally. So that contrast between what they were selling and what they are and their status in France was something that I really wanted to explore. And then at nighttime, because I'm quite visual, I mean, all these sea of souvenirs, you know, glowing in the dark was really, um, it was really uh, magical, but also very sort of melancholic because you know, there was no joy in, in these sort of uh, glowing souvenirs. There was because I, you know, because I realized that there was something deeper there. So with my films, it always starts with something that I want to explore. Uh, I went to Paris a few months later and then started started the project. So obviously, reading about it, researching, you know, about these guys, you 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 know, you read so much nonsense online of people saying, "Oh, they're all part of this big cult of extreme Muslims." Well, it's absolutely nonsense. So, um, and just by making the film and speaking to them and shooting, when you actually learn about the story. So this is always my approach. Mm -hmm. The film is actually the, the process of, of discovery. Right. And Katya? Yeah, I very much agree with Star because that was also the same, uh, same for me. I, I came to Argentina with like, one question, why it didn't happen, why abortion wasn't uh, legalized in August 2018. And I was hoping to find like an answer, and then they, and then they realized it's impossible. There's no answer. They're, they're so, uh, so it basically the film was sort of born out of the conversation that I had with uh, uh, pro-choice and pro-life activists. I went to, um, I did initially. I planned to film it in Buenos Aires, but then I realized in order to understand also pro-life. Um, uh, argument, I have to go to the most conservative part of Argentina, which is uh, mm -hmm. in, in the north. Uh, so, and there, and there I came across a very different reality than Buenos Aires, and that was very, uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, so I had 
some interviews planned um, when I was going to do that, but many of them got cancelled. So I had to work in that and I had to find uh, someone else to talk to. Uh, and so it was quite a journey, but um, it was very unbelievable. Something seemed like very, very fast and I was just trying to get to every place. I spent as much time doing this. It was like full uh, non-stop work for 10 days. Right. And uh, we've got some questions from YouTube, but I'll go back to those in a minute. Whilst, um, I'm just going to ask now uh, some particular question for all of you. Um, first with, uh, I guess, Tao, but this could also apply to the three of you. Um, you've all uh, filmed uh, people that, um, I guess, uh, are sometimes concerned about being shown on camera. You've worked with young kids or like people with a political opinion or with a, um, I guess, a different opinions to the ones uh, that are um, ruling in those countries. And um, I was wondering, how do you build trust uh, with your subjects? Like what, what are the ways of, of building that trust and, and letting them tell your stories? Mm -hmm. uh, so you're absolutely right. So the contrib contributors in the film, you know, they are all quite, they're vulnerable. I'm not able to, to reveal their identity because they all live, in, live in and work in France illegally. That was, that was the, you know, the biggest challenge. I wasn't able to show their faces. Um, in terms of, you know, the approach to, to how the film was made was very much dictated by that, by that, by that sort of restriction. And how do I sort of uh, honor their, you know, I wanted to protect them. And it's not only that they're worried about being uh, extradited or ex uh, deported. It's also that uh, that's something that I learned later on, that they're actually embarrassed that their families back in Senegal will find out that actually what they do in France, in Paris, is selling souvenirs. Because many of these guys, when they left Senegal, and they're obviously send, sending money back home, their families think that they've they all got really good jobs in, in, in Europe. So for them, it's this kind of big, you know, this kind of amazing thing that they've managed to, to reach Europe and they all got great jobs. So they often lie to their families about what is it that they actually do. Uh, so they can't possibly have their, film, you know, their identities because friends and family, neighbors mm -hmm. will, will identify them. Mm -hmm. And that very much dictated my approach uh, in form. So how, how, how I'm going to make the film, what it would look like. So I started off by filming them and then very soon I realized that I can't. And then that uh, made me think of a different way of, of telling the story, which was uh, images which will, be, will work as metaphors, as symbolism for their struggle, for, for the story they're telling me. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Right. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, does any Lorena or Katia have anything to add? Uh, well, uh, I was talking to everyone who was willing to talk to me uh, on camera. So I was um, always uh, uh, very open about the idea of the film, why I'm doing this and what I'm trying to achieve. So just to give the background information to the person uh, who's interested in uh, giving me the interview. One restriction I encountered, because um, before going to Argentina, I learned about this woman uh, who's uh, known by the name of Bilen. It's not her real name, it's her media name. So, and, I, and this woman was imprisoned for uh, over two years for miscarriage. Um, and this is one of the most like outrageous stories that I've heard, you know, uh, uh, that they came out of this um, uh, abortion ban. And, uh, so, and I was trying to reach out to her and to talk to her because I felt like if she tells me the story with her own words, that would be very powerful. But then I realized that um, we said the interview, but then the, in the very last moment she pulled out saying that uh, she doesn't want your identity to be known to the public and uh, she doesn't want to be recognized. So we found a way that I, I hired a voice artist who would voice the exact interview that Billion gave to me. So there was uh, this question of uh, protecting uh, my character's privacy she moved, she moved away after she was uh, released thanks to her lawyer's efforts. She left the town, she, her hometown, and she started a new life. So she didn't want to be known. So, probably that. Um, I guess my process was on the first 
um, hand, I relied on time. And it was a documentary that, you know, the shooting process is spun for four years from 2014 to 2016. I wasn't there all the time. I just spent um, around two to, from two to three weeks at a time, but I had kind of online contact with them. So that was one thing that, you know, because I had so much time, I kind of developed a very kind of strong relationship with them. And the other thing was that I tried, and this is related to my documentary practice more generally, I tried to involve them in the decision making. So kind of, you know, relinquish the power of the filmmaker and try to involve the subjects as well in how the film was going to be made and, you know, like their representation. Um, so yeah, those two Great. things. Um, and uh, with Lorena to follow up from that question, um, you all the people on the film they're all women and i wonder if that was a, i guess a conscious decision and whether they're like men wanted to get involved or didn't want to get involved what was just your decision uh, creatively yeah well it wasn't uh you know wasn't, uh you know a thought a decision i wanted to make a, a documentary about women's issues and girls and i knew that the protagonists of the documentary were going to be girls what i didn't know is that in their families there weren't any male uh, figures so their fathers are absent um they didn't have any brothers um so it wasn't it just happened it wasn't um um intention uh, intentional well it was intentional is everyone who participated in the um, uh, creative and, and technical process of the filmmaking were women and that was intentional we wanted to you know like um um use women's um um technical skills in the making of the film um and that was a conscious decision yeah and uh to uh katia um, what is the situation now, like in Argentina? Do you know if, if they've managed to uh, put that bill uh, forward, and, and what is the situation at the moment there? Yeah. So one of the one, one of the one of my hopes making this film was that the story will come back. So I felt like I'm just I'm just getting started, and uh, so this year I was quite unprecedented. So the bill was put back to uh, for the congresses. Uh, consideration and it was for the first time backed by the sitting president of Argentina, uh, Fernandez. So that's not what happened before. There was no such endorsement. So obviously now there is a, a strong um, sentiment that maybe this year, but let me remind you, this is going to be like eighth time for this bill uh, to be presented for in front of the Congress. But then uh, the pandemic happened. So the bill uh, was supposed to go into the consideration in, in March, but then uh, from on March 20th, Argentina went to a strict lockdown. So uh, uh, to my knowledge, people are only allowed to outside to get food or medicine. So, and the Congress just started its sessions. I mean, it confirmed that it will remain the priority, but at this point, uh, it's it's hard to tell, and also you know with the pandemic situation and confinement, uh, the situation with uh, women rights uh, deteriorated because uh, some of the uh, you know some of the medicine that uh, became harder to get for women, and also it's um, it's pretty critical that it would go ahead this year. So that's that's my hope that um, there will be safe uh, access for women to. A reproductive healthcare. Yeah, hopefully that will change uh, in the near future. Um, I'm going to go to audience questions because I think they're building up, and then I'll go back to to mine for a minute. Uh, the first question we've got is: uh, really enjoyed all of his films. Uh, for all filmmakers, are these stories uh, that also gain media attention locally locally in their country from? Sorry. <laughs> are these stories gaining media attention locally in the countries uh, from filmmakers or news channels? Well, I just, um, the story is obviously known in Argentina, but as much outside Argentina, so that, um, and that was my, Initially, uh, like, so that 
what what happened uh, that the abortion wasn't legalized wasn't a big deal anywhere else and like how come i mean it was 2018 so and i i mean making this film i thought maybe i'll help you know shine some spotlights on the on the story so but mm -hmm. we'll see what happens <laughs> uh, but yeah uh hopefully this year will be the year for argentina mm -hmm. And uh, Tan or Lorena, anything to add to the question? Um, I don't think particularly in relation to this film, I mean, the, to this film, I mean, the feminization of poverty in Colombia has happened for a very long time. Um, uh, so it's still a discussion going on about how to, you know, like address it and deal with it. Um, but what it's interesting, what is happening in Colombia, which doesn't have a strong connection, uh, but it's interesting anyway, is that there is some sort of a me too, a campaign happening now within the film industry. Um, so obviously exposing the fact that um, it's a very unequal um, industry in terms of gender um, roles and also all sorts of you know abuses and things that have happened. So it, there is a momentum there now, mm -hmm. which is good. With my film, it, it's, you know, it's doing its festival run in, in March and it hasn't been shown in, in France. The film, when, when, when the festival run will end, uh, either end of this year or beginning of, of, of next year, it will be released online on, on a platform I, that I can't uh, mention yet. But, you know, then I'll be very interested to, to see what impact it might have in France. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it affects, you know, migrants uh, living undocumented in lots of European countries. So it's not just, you know, a subject that is concerning uh, France, but... The film is taking place in France. It's about, you know, we mentioned the French police there. Um, so I'll be very interested to see what sort of impact uh, it will have. From, you know, from comments I, I receive when the film has been shown previously at festivals online for, uh, for audiences in, in the States, for example. So, I, I, you know, I've noticed that, yeah, people are taken, taken uh, uh, by it or to it or respond to it. Um, which obviously is very important. This guy, just to mention that this guy were very, very, you know, they have very bad experience with media. They had journalists documenting, coming in for a day, filming them, maybe doing an interview or two, and just go back. So they felt exploited. So for me to, to gain uh, trust was something that took time. I'm very, very close friends with them now. We're all of them. We you know mm -hmm. we're on WhatsApp all the time. Uh, you know, sending mess, uh, you know, messages, photos. I, I check on them, they check on me. When when I was ill, uh, I mentioned to Natalia earlier, I had the COVID, you know, I, I, I was getting texts from them. So we're very, very close, but it takes time, especially with people mm -hmm. who are vulnerable, who had really bad experience with media, felt exploited. Gaining trust, it takes time. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's hard to convince them that you're not one of these people who come from, from, from somewhere in, in London, want to make a film and just... Just, just disappears and never comes back. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, that's that's the role of you know filmmaker. You know, we work with real people. They're not just characters that we cast. We work with them. We maintain relationships. I mean, fr I'm friends with all the characters and contributors in my in, in my previous films. I just got a text from a guy from from the previous film the other day. He needed work money. He needed some money to come to from Romania to the UK because he's, he's ill. And he can't, he can't get any medical treatment in, in, in Romania, so he's coming. So I helped him with a bit of money. But you make a film, you know, you know these guys will always, you know, be part of your life. You don't just move mm. away. Yeah, getting some yeah. sort of uh, responsibility that filmmakers, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. filmmakers have. And, Absolutely, and yeah. And it's great that you mentioned, yeah. Um, we've mm. got another audience question from uh, Tom. I've got a question for all of the filmmakers. How were you able to get the funding to make these films? <laughs> <laughs> funding is always a tricky yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was, um, I was, um, my, the way that I managed to get some funding first was through the foundation. Uh, we put together some promotional videos and we, be, we were able to raise some money. And then um, the council in my town in Spain gave me some money as well to finish the project, which was good. And with that money, I was able to pay everyone um, involved in the production. So not much, um, but enough to, you know, like pay mm -hmm. people's salaries, Great. basically. <laughs> Anyone else? Some insights? 
In my case, it's, it's self-funding in the case so far with my shorts. I'm fortunate enough to have freelance work in London and I teach in the university as well. And I was making the film, which was exactly the same with my uh, previous two shorts so far, where I was able and fortunate enough to work in between uh, paid work that I've got in my studio in London and my teaching uh, in university in Norwich. So when I know I have a, a week off, I just jump on it. I jumped on the Eurostar, uh, spent a week with them, went back a couple of weeks later, the same. Sometimes, you know, it was shot over a course of maybe in, in total probably six months or so with week stints uh, on a Eurostar coming to France and mm -hmm. coming back. Uh, this is how I was able so far. Obviously, with a longer form project, that won't be possible because it will require more work and that's when funding will come, will come into place. Yeah, and for me, it was, uh, my first, for me, it was uh, my first um, independent documentary film. So it's uh, self-funded. Uh, but I was lucky that I had a freelance job in Argentina at the time. So I was able to stay after when the job was done and uh, complete the film. So that helped a lot. And um, since I don't have uh, salary to pay, because it's just me, so that was not an issue. This is a struggle of documentary filmmakers and hopefully the industry gets a bit better for that. <laughs> um, a last question on YouTube from uh, Nula. Loved, I think it's for you, Katia, loved how you closed the green handkerchief with those gorgeous feminist murals. Are there any commemorating this abortion fight or um, ones of any present day Argentinian feminist or struggles? Like, did you find any of those? Uh, so, the question is there any commemoration of um, the current? I haven't been in Argentina since 2018, so, and, you know, like, cities like Buenos Aires, always, everything is happening in the country, it's on the streets. The, the amount of murals in Argentina, uh, particularly in Buenos Aires, is incredible. So I didn't have to work hard to get these murals, they're just everywhere, especially along the route that protesters took on the way to the Congress. So, um, yeah, it's pretty incredible. And I think it's this whole, um, some of the activists I talked to, is like, the fight is on the streets. If you're not in the streets, you're not fighting. And I was like, oh, that's it's very, that was very inspirational. So that's why um, I think many of the people I contacted among activists, they were very willing to talk because uh, they really wanted to get the story out to, to be seen, to get the visibility. And uh, I've got another question, um, a general one. Um, have you uh, been involved with any online festivals recently? And how is your experience been? Any positive <laughs> or negative aspects that you'd like to, to let us know about? Not about ours, if it's negative, please. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it was, not, it was just amazing so far. So far, I, I've been really enjoying it, you know, meeting people online. Uh, I did, I think the first one was AFI Docs in the US, and that was just fantastic, you know, meeting all these people, obviously you don't meet them in person, and, and you know, I really miss it. I mean, that's the biggest thing in festivals, uh, meeting uh, like-minded people, uh, you know, creating, I, I'm still very good friends, and I made uh, friends, fellow filmmakers friends in festivals uh, uh, from the last few years, so that's not possible. But, but I'm enjoying that sort of virtual thing. I'm enjoying meeting people online. I enjoy the accessibility that uh, virtual festivals got, where people are able to watch uh, films that otherwise geographically, perhaps, they might have not been able to travel and watch them. Mm -hmm. And so far, it's been great. But what I miss the most, I guess, it's being able to watch the film in a physical uh, cinema mm -hmm. on a big screen. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that that would be possible. But uh, I've been enjoying it so far. Some of them are geo-blocked, so I wasn't able to actually watch the films, but some are, some are not. So it's been, yeah, it's just, it's a learning curve, but you know, everything is new, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is, we're learning like a new way of living. So the virtual festival landscape is part of loads of other things that we need to learn yeah. to, to change and adapt, adapt, adapt to. Anyone else, anything else to add? 
Yeah, I also had like very positive experience so far. It's uh, my, my first time uh, in uh, participating in a film festival, so that's obviously very exciting. And I had like one um, online screening with the lift of sessions. Um, so I don't know if you can hear me. We can. You uh, froze, but we can still hear you. No, not anymore. <laughs> Oh, no. oh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Um, Want anything to add, Lorena, whilst we go back to Katia? Um, I would just say it has been an amazing experience to be able to attend festivals in, you know, like the States or South America from Bath, where I'm currently. Um, but as Tan was saying, I, I miss the experience, the shared experience of watching a film collectively in a cinema. And I also think that, you know, primarily when we talk about impact documentaries, as well as watching the film in a cinema as a collective experience, the discussions that emerge from that, um, you know, from that um, experience are very important. Um, and that's something that up to some extent we are able to have here, but it's not the same. You're reading the questions from the audience. We are not engaging like, you know, like physically in the same space. So it's still some sort of a barrier, which it may be overcome somehow, but I think it's still not quite um, the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And Katia, do you want to try again? See if we can... Yeah, right. sorry about that. Uh, yes, well, um, and um, I think that it's uh, it's very important to to feel a part of the community. So even though we're all in our houses, it's kind of nice to to feel a part of you know uh, this uh, vision festival. And um, I am my film is yet to be shown at another festival, but they decided to wait until mm. the physical uh, presence can be possible. So. I wonder if they're gonna change the decision to in favor of virtual, or they're gonna wait for like uh, until I guess end of this year. So we'll see. But so far, the virtual uh, festivals have been like uh, such pleasure to just to engage and see other other filmmakers work. That's great. Um, yeah, I agree that obviously like, online uh, has brought some good stuff, but. Um also that we should support uh, physical cinemas and I think they opened yesterday in the UK so please go mm -hmm. to them especially the independent ones Genesis, Rio and all of those um, and yeah we'll send them all of our support from here as well mm. but um, thank you very very much to the three of you for letting us thank show you. your film uh, it was a great Q&A thank, you. And, thank uh, you very much thank you and for the rest of you, this is the last event of the festival, um, but you still have until the end of today to watch the video on the man strands and re-watch any of the live Q&As if you want to by logging into your member site on the website. And I would just like, uh, like to take this uh, opportunity to thank all of our um, sponsors and partners, Radiant Circus, the Embassy of Spain, um, you can film review, Eon platform and uh, all the others and thank you to all of you for watching us during this whole week. It's been great and we're really happy with, with, with the outcome and uh, just uh, to remind you as well that there's still time to vote for your favourite films on the Audience Award so uh, do that. That will be left on the website for a couple more days and we would love to hear from you of uh, what were your favourite films and what you like about them. Thank you very much and we'll see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.